Well, the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, uh, the NICD, has recorded 26,976 new COVID-19 infections in the country in the last 24 hours. And that's taking the total number of cases now to 3,231,000. Another 54 people have died from COVID-19-related complications. And that now puts the national death toll to 90,000 226 since the pandemic began. The test positivity rate now stands at 32.2%. Uh, uh, for more on this trend, we're now joined by Professor Adrian Puren, who's the Acting Executive Director at the National Institute of Communicable Diseases. Prof, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Uh, always good to talk to you. Good evening, Peter. Thank you very much and good evening to your viewers. All right, Prof, um, Omicron has been with us for a while now. The last time we spoke, it literally had just hit the streets and so little was known about this variant and what it might do in terms of a trajectory, spread and, uh, uh, you know, speed. I just wonder, do we know much more about it now? Have we got a better understanding of its path uh, and uh, its, its speed, all of that, is it becoming clearer now? I think some things are certainly clearer. I think in, at least in South Africa with regard to the trajectory, I know that um, we may not be testing equally across the provinces, perhaps or in different ways, uh, but certainly the, traje the trajectory for Hateng is, has been pretty clear um, in terms of really rapid rise. And we're seeing this in the provinces, the other provinces as well now. So in other words, all, uh, I guess, eight provinces, there's just one more province, are in, if we want to call it the so-called fourth wave, very rapid trajectory. Mm -hmm. I think the other um, interesting and very important observation, and I think this still needs to be borne out, is that the the, the, the word is a decoupling, in other words. So we have these this very rapid rise in the numbers. But in fact, when we look at the reports that are coming through with regard to the, the hospital-based systems in terms of severity of disease, um, ICU um, admissions and so forth, that, that's a very different picture to what we had seen in the previous um, Delta wave. There's also, I think, very useful information. I, again, I haven't seen the, the details mm -hmm. of the methodology, for example, but I think these discovery is, for example, in line with those particular observations from the public health sector, also indicated, for example, that there may be a, a marked decrease in protection um, in terms of vaccinate, vaccinated individuals with regard to infections, but certainly there's still a, a fair proportion of protection in terms of against hospitalizations, for example. So I think there are certainly um, really encouraging elements uh, with regard to that. I think when we look at the UK, for example, which I know we always always try to compare um, notes with, uh, in fact, but they may have a different um, outcome, in other words. I think their major concern is that is certainly they are seeing large numbers, as, as we've been seeing, but I guess the concern, just as we are, is the major concern is around uh, what will happen in terms of outcomes. I think the outcomes are the, the critical indicator, that is, yeah. serious infections leading to hospitalizations uh, and death, and thus far, we're not seeing that just yet in, in South Africa. All right, let's talk about this decoupling. Um, why do you think that that's happened? Is it the vaccinations? Is it that we've got probably a significant number of people who've had COVID-19, built up some antibodies and didn't even know that they were sick at any point? Absolutely. So I think these are the um, current thoughts that are prevailing um, is that, in fact, um, as you know, many people have, do not go for testing. Um, so there may have been multiple exposures to this particular, uh, to, to, to um, the virus that has allowed a certain degree of, of protection, at least um, in terms of the serious um, effects. But I think also I think the importance possibly of the, the vaccine campaign, and I think uh, we will need obviously more data to, in order for us to understand who's ending up in our hospitals. Because again, if you look at the rates of hospitalizations in those critical age groups, you know, the 60 and above age groups, um, that's very different to what we've seen in the previous waves. And as we know, again, association is not necessarily causation, but certainly when you look at the levels of vaccination in those particular age groups, those are obviously much higher um, than in the, the younger age groups. So we're certainly seeing higher hospitalizations in those younger age groups versus the, old, the older age mm -hmm. groups. So I think vac vaccine has certainly played a, a role. It may not have been as protective as, and this refers primarily to the 
Pfizer, where we have, I think, some information through discovery. It would be important to see what's happening with the J&J as well, um, because, again, we've been, had the opportunity, at least the healthcare workers have had the opportunity to be have a booster dose. So it would be important to, to know those types of information, but at least it would appear that the vaccine certainly contributed to what we're we're currently seeing. I think in the UK, again, it's a different picture where, as you know, there's a lot, a great deal of encouragement to have um, the, the, the booster as well, the additional booster. Yeah. Reinfection rates. So people get vaccinated uh, and they are getting infected again. There does seem to be something in this variant. We'll talk about, um, I mean, we've talked about the the um, decoupling in terms of hospitalizations and illness, but the infection rate's quite high. I'm, to I'm told that the beta variant, you're more likely to get reinfected if your first infection was beta than if your first infection was delta. Yes, I think we have to possibly look at um, the, the levels of protection or the types of protection. I think again, many people are trying to look at what we call neutralization antibodies, for example. And of course, I think we need to bear in mind the, the duration. So I think there is some evidence of boosting, for example. And as you know, there is the idea that, in fact, your first infection or your, your first, the, the infection, in fact, um, followed by the vaccine, the vaccine is seen as, as the booster. So I think those are the, the types of thinking mm -hmm. that may well play a role in terms of the, the levels of, of protection, depending on the variant um, and depending on um, whether you had natural infection as, as well. I think from the beginning, we always suspected that um, your protection will diminish over time. We just weren't sure how long that time period might be. Are we starting to get some feedback on that at this stage? Uh, I know that the change in variance changes the equation each time, but are we starting to get a sense at least of, you know, how long a, a vaccine might have efficacy for? Yes, I, I think the initial, I think before, Omicron came along. I think um, certainly when we looked at that, those the out the outcomes there. Um, I think it was six to eight months in terms of um, seeing so-called waning uh, immunity. But again, I think we need to be cautious about that because the waning immunity may be the, around the antibody responses. But I think the the critical con the, the critical con consideration is really around the, the so-called T cell um, responses as well. And those T cell responses are probably. Um, in terms of the prevention of hospitalizations and serious disease is probably uh, the important component. So certainly in terms of the initial infection, the antibodies are certainly critical. And I guess there is a level of waning and it's thought that the boosting is very important. But I think it's that's one particular aspect of the um, responses. I think the second aspect is, which is really critical. And that's, I said, as I indicated, is around the um, serious disease and, and hospitalizations, I think, is really around the, the T cell responses. The Omicron variant, um, it, it's less um, severe in terms of the symptoms that it's causing. Could it be it's the makeup of the variant? Uh, we know that for sure, yes, um, herd immunity, antibodies, all of that are in the equation, but have we been able to look at the structure of the variant and say, this is why it's less severe? Yes, I think Beth, you, you raise important questions. I think there are questions around the, the epidemiology of the virus, and there are questions around how the virus behaves in, in the laboratory setting. But you're quite right. It's really looking at the entire virus, that constellation of all the mutations. How does that affect um, the responses in terms of the pathogenicity, the rate of transmission, and so forth. So those are key considerations mm. uh, when one looks at the virus. So I think there are different components. I think we can look at the so-called epidemiology, the so-called force of um, infection, for example, rates of transmission, in, in other words, um, the R value, the reproductive number in that context. But also, I think it's in that combination with uh, laboratory-based uh, um, data looking at, for example, um, the so-called transmissibility of the virus, for example, changes in the mutations, for example, in terms of neutralization. So I think it's that constellation um, of information that really tells us um, more about this particular virus. I don't think you can look at things um, in isolation. And very often, 
Um, and then that includes modeling exercises as well. I think you can certainly take certain parameters in, in consideration. But it, I think it's all those triangulation of those particular data that tells us more about this particular virus. And the settings, again, I, I know that very often I've been talking about comparing ourselves to the UK because we've just been looking at the data from the UK. And again, that particular setting may well be different because of the levels of vaccine, um, the levels of exposure to, to natural infection. Um, so the, the responses may well be, be different. Do we have any idea when we might start to see the peak? Um, is, it, is it showing any signs of a timeline or again, you know, it's guesswork, yes, modeling at best, but uh, are we starting to see some indicators of when likely we might peak? Yeah, so again, I, I come back to the point. Yeah. I think that I think Professor Shabir Mahdi had indicated um, that there's a recent study showing fairly high levels of, of antibody, for example, in circulation in Gauteng. So again, I think, and putting that together with what I can see other hints um, in the recent data certainly indicates that we may well have reached the peak. I see a blip, um, but let's keep an eye over the next um, couple of days and, and see whether or not that initial decline, which I think is, is really evident, um, showing the so-called uh, decrease in uh, percentage test positivity is certainly, certainly showing a decline. So I think my sense is that at least for Gauteng, we may well have reached um, the peak. I think the other provinces, I think, are still in their, their upward trajectory. And so maybe in the next uh, week mm. or two, they may certainly show um, declines as well. All right. Professor Adrian Perrin, we'll leave it there. Thank you very, very much indeed uh, for joining us. And uh, your insights always greatly appreciated. Thank you. All right, that's uh, Professor Adrian Perrin, Acting Executive Director of the uh, the NICD. And just a reminder of uh, the uh, uh, cases that uh, we're facing at this stage, um, 26,976 have been uh, recorded in the last 24-hour cycle. Sadly, 54 uh, deaths also recorded in that time. And uh, this is from 83,864 tests done in the last 24 hours. And that then translates to a positivity rate of 32.2%.